Okay guys, good morning. So, since the uh, beginning of my channel, whenever I've worked with a, a particular bullet from a particular manufacturer, I've always matched it to that bullet manufacturer's load data. As an example, running a Hornady bullet, we're going to run with the Hornady load data manual. If we're going to run a Sierra, we're going to run it with the Sierra load data manual. And I've, I've kept the load data manuals uh, just to a couple. That way, uh, my viewers that follow me don't have to have every one of them. But I hope that uh, as the reloaders are, um, you know, expanding on their journey, you get every load data manual you can. Okay. So there's a couple reasons. Uh, just off the top of my head that I've always done it that way. One, I always felt that if I'm going to have a viewer invest money in learning how to reload, that I give them something that will help them to complete that and be successful. So when you have the load data manual to match that bullet, now you have the proper cartridge overall length, we have a min charge and a max charge. We know our velocity is going to, um, you know, be a product of a min or max charge. And we know that if our bullet is within that velocity, it's going to operate in the way that the manufacturer designed that bullet, um, i.e. a hollow point is going to properly expand, this, this type of thing. Uh, the, the other reason that I always did it that way, matching the bullet to the low data manual, is because I always knew that once I put a video out, I didn't want a million questions coming back on me. So by doing it that way, a uh, beginner reloader, as you're matching the bullet to the recipe, you, your success is so great to complete that round that you succeed. And so that's why I've always matched that up, right? Well, about 18 months ago, um, I started working with the Summit City Bullets, and I did uh, some videos on the 124 grain, and I really thought I'd done a video on the 147. I, I can't remember. I, I really can't. But over the last year or so, I've had a lot of guys saying, would you do a video on the 147? Would you do a video on the 147 and I'm like well why? Well, well, well why? Then it's dawned on me over the last month here especially last week when I had COVID sitting in my recliner thinking you know I've got a lot of guys wanting to load that 147 I have a lot of guys saying I can't find the load data but I sat in my recliner for a few days there and I thought that's weird because when I got those 147s, I just went to my load data manual and I loaded them up. Uh, since then, I've shot uh, several different powders through that bullet. I've only shot maybe 200 of them, but I've had great success. When we get to talking about this bullet design pretty quick, when I show you the bullet for Summit City, I'm going to explain the purpose of this weight and uh, bullet design which is fabulous, it's what I found out by my hands on. Well, why would you want to order a 147 and load it? Well, I'm going to tell you that pretty quick. So I realized something. I'm loading these bullets and I'm just going out shooting them, but a lot of guys aren't. And so they're like stepping back and they're a little bit afraid. And so for this video, we'll just say we do this. I'm going to show you guys my approach. This is just my approach. Take what you want, leave what you don't, but we're going to load or the 147 grain round nose beveled base. It's got a 0.356 diameter uh, bullet, and this is by Summit City. I'll put a link in the description box below. Um, this is going to be a great video. Uh, I will include the links for the, the bullet, the, the Starline cases. I'm going to load it up on the Lyman All American 8. This is a fan. Fantastic press. Uh, it, it, the more I use it, the more I love it. And then we're going to use their their uh, new uh, pro dies. They're stainless steel. They're all I can say is they're silk, and 
they're they're made to last a lifetime. I love the sizing die on it. It's uh, it contacts every bit of the real estate on the case and returns it to its original Sammy Min. It's a great die and they're easy to set up. So this will be a good video and I'll put links in the description box below. So anything you want to check out, you can. Now, for the remainder of the video, I want you to take what you want and leave what you don't. Not a lot of guys are going to agree with me, but this is how I've always done it, okay? So in like decades past, decades past, when you didn't have, we didn't have low data like they have today. It wasn't as easy to come by. And so you'd get this bullet. You'd go into whatever manuals you had, and you couldn't match that bullet up. As an example, you know, 158 grain semi wad cutter for 357 mag. You could match that up. Lots of load data for that. But then you'd come into this uh, funky ca uh, bullet weight, and no one had it except now I want to talk about this before we get into this I want to just I want to mention two pet peeves of mine and this isn't a pet peeve I'm sharing with you so it can be your pet peeve I'm gonna tell you about two pet peeves I have so you can sit back and maybe it will help you to be a better and more efficient reloader that's all. That's, I'm not trying to peeve anyone out here. Okay. I have two pet peeves. One, out in social media, you will see guys, and it's like they're recruiting. They, they want guys to hurrah what they say. So they put this statement out there and they say, well, any company that manufacturers a bullet they can't provide their own load data should not be in business well, let's see that kind of uh, takes away everything I've learned of being able to develop a load for whatever bullet I run into because I'm a reloader just took away that from me didn't you and the other thing is I grew up in the time where you kind of had to figure it out. It wasn't the entitlement generation. I don't think any company should have to put specific load data out when I understand the basics of how to approach a bullet to begin my load data, which I'm going to show you pretty quick. Right? The other pet peeve of mine is when someone says that this load data book is it's a little irrelevant because they really don't tell you which bullets they were specifically using. See, the old reloaders knew something. They knew something about consistency and uniformity in bullet design and bullet weight and bullet pressure. They knew something. What was that? I'm going to share something with you. Now, this book, I'll put a link in the description box below. I'm working out of the second edition. This is the Modern Reloading by Richard Lee. I have the second edition. I don't know what edition you have. I'm not going to show you this book, but I'm going to go to the 9mm Luger section. And I'm going to spell this out for you really easy. If you look under the 9mm Luger section, you're going to come into the load data information. It starts with the 147 grain jacketed bullet. Now stop right there. Do you see this bullet? What is its actual makeup? I didn't ask you what design. What's the makeup? This is a lead bullet. Okay. I'm going to ask you this. Is this copper plated? No. Is it jacketed? No. Is it lead? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make this basic. This is no insult to anyone. But what color is this press? Green. 
What color is this press? Orange. Okay. See if I get this it's so early. And my hand, I'm getting old. Is that jacketed? Is that copper plated? It's lead. Guys, keep it simple. Now watch. It's gonna amaze you. Just blow your mind. I have a 147 grain jacketed bullet. Was that a jacketed bullet? No. Keep going. 147 grain lead bullet. Oh, yeah. Orange, green. Gee, the guys that tell you that this book is irrelevant because they didn't really tell you what bullet they were using, they missed out on that one thing in school. Keep it simple because all the old reloaders and all those manufacturers knew something. See, we have 147 grain copper plated. No, we're not working with a copper plated bullet, are we? And then we have a 147 grain XTP bullet. Now, there's your, there's your specific bullet design, right? It's a makeup of being a jacket, and it's a design is an expanding hollow point, and so that's more specific, right? Well, see, uh, Richard Lee knew something. He's a brilliant guy. If you've got a 147 grain lead bullet, it doesn't matter if you have a round nose, flat top, if you have a truncated cone, if you have a round nose, beveled base, it doesn't matter. It's just a lead bullet. And they all have one same characteristic. So that characteristic between all these lead bullets are they're going to be close in internal pressures, which is the candy for you and me. Because now I can take and I can match that weight bullet. I can take this 147 grain lead bullet. I can go into this data right here, 147 grain lead bullet. Now, what did we learn when we had a known bullet from a known manufacturer and we matched it to a manufacturer's low data manual? What did we learn? We started at min, oh, min. Now, min meant we're not going to blow the gun up because of a pressure spike, but we could damage the gun if the bullet gets stuck in the bore and we follow another one behind it. Well, that's not good. So we learned that. So we learned that, well, we don't really start at min, but we go a little higher, maybe a tenth or two, right? So now I have this 147 grain round nose bullet by Summit City, and I found 147 grain lead bullet. Now I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 powders to select from. When I approach this, with whatever powder I'm going to use, I know something. You take any one of these powders, and you, you run a min charge on them, you will never blow that gun up. That is ridiculous. I hear guys say that. You, well, you can't do that. You can blow a gun up. That's ridiculous. Heard that in a gun shop when I about, about just, just like, I, I couldn't believe that. I said, you would have to go 80,000 pounds to blow the gun up. I mean, 80,000 PSI to blow the gun up. And the guy looked at me. I said, you're not going to produce, you're not going to produce 80,000 PSI off three grains of whatever. It's not going to happen. But what you can do is this, is you could accidentally run a jacketed bullet with a lead and now with a lead recipe 
and your velocity is a little slower and because of the Bruno hardness, the jacket is harder and you stuck it in the board. So therefore we go back to orange press, green press. You're going to match your jack of the bullet with the jack of the bullet down. You're going to match the copper plated with the copper plated. You're going to match the lead with the lead. You're going to see that the lead and the copper plated are more close and they're going to be more forgiving for one another. Um, if you're going to use a lead bullet in the jacketed, that's going to require a, a, a chronograph, which I would, we're going to talk about a chronograph in a minute, it's a must, okay, it's just a must. So now we have a 147 grain bullet, it don't matter what kind, except it's lead, and we're going to match the 147 grain lead bullet data. So we're going to select a powder, now just so you know, I've ran uh, I, I think I've run both 7 and 5 on this. I'm the worst bookkeeper. Yeah, Walter Bunning will tell you that. I would keep the worst records. He needs to be my secretary, I'm telling you. I think I've ran both 7 and 5. I've ran the Silhouette. I've ran the True Blue. Um, and now I'm going to be running this Acura. Um, so, um, whatever powder you're going to run. Now, for this video, we're running number 2 by Acura. By, by accurate, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> the min charge is 3.2. I only have four tenths to work with because my max charge is, is uh, make sure I get this right, 3.6. So I have 3.2 to 3.6. I have a four tenths window. Now, I want you to wrap your mind around this just for a second, okay? I don't want to confuse this, but as we go through the video, you're going to see this, and I'll do my best to explain it. These bullets at the cartridge length Lee's calling for of 1.145 tend to stick in the rifling of some of my pistols. Just, just a couple of them that I can think of. So I have to seat 5,000 steeper to one point. Uh, 140, okay? That's going to raise the internal starting pressures, okay? But ain't that enough to blow the gun up? No. So if I take this bullet and I'm going to match it to a min charge of 3.2, but in my mind I'm going to bump it a tenth to 3.3, now when I sink that bullet just five thousandths, from my experience of always doing this, it is nowhere near enough to blow your hands off. Come off it. That's, that's stupid talk because they wouldn't put the data in there, okay? I'll guarantee you, if I seat that bullet by five thousandths, even at one tenth above a min, my pressures won't be as high as if I started out with the, the max of 3.6, okay? But you don't start at 3.6. That's where guys make the mistake. So we're going to take this bullet, uh, a 147 grain lead bullet, and we're going to match it to the 147 grain lead bullet data. And I'm going to start a, a tenth taller, just a tenth taller, okay? 3.3, and I will end up with a... Um, cartridge length of 1.140. Now, there's a little bit of a disclaimer here. I normally, when I do this, I would only do two or three and I would chronograph them. I'm going to do ten with the number two, um, but I'm already through my quick loads, ran that. My quick loads is telling me what my internal starting pressures are going to be. I know I'm going to be pretty safe with that quick load. So the neat thing is going to be is when I chronograph these, I can compare that to what my quick load is just putting out. And I am on my way to develop this. So for you, what you have to do is, you know, you take a, a Hornady uh, 44 caliber XTP bullet and you run it through their load data manual and you don't chronograph it, I, I, I don't care. You, you know about what you're going to be looking off their velocity per given charge weight. You know you're in the area, hey, bullet's working, and you know it's accurate. Okay, good, great. That's great. I don't have a problem. 
But now a chronograph, what a chronograph is going to do is just going to show us the direct result of either, uh, you know, uh, low pressure, high pressure, that's going to uh, definitely play out in low velocity, high velocity. You know, at 3.2, um, at 3.2, the min charge, um, it's showing that we're going to have a velocity of 852. So if we run 3.3 and we look at that and it's pretty doggone close, now we got the dog tracking. And you can begin a tenth of a grain at a time, incrementing up, watching your velocities and dialing your accuracy and your function in. Your pistol's got to function, it's got to fully cycle, it's got to eject properly. So now you're in the business of developing your loads and you have no business doing this without a chronograph. You just don't. The moral of this part of the video is showing you how you're going to take a load data uh, book such as this Lee that doesn't tell you what specific bullet. We don't need to be bottle fed. Because I know something. I've got a 147 grain uh, round nose. Uh, this is 147 grain lead, but they're both lead. They're going to work. And another thing, technically, technically, even if you knew the exact bullet, you really still should chronograph. I don't all the time. Okay, don't do do as I say, not as I do. But but if you don't chronograph, think about it. I don't always chronograph because of my experience and my knowledge. When you're new to this, you need to chronograph all you can. And then once you get some experience under your belt, you're gonna go, yeah, I know how to match this up. I, I know what's gonna work, I know it's not. And then when I bring my quick loads into it, yeah, it's really bringing a lot together for me. So, everything's a learning curve, but this is how I do it. I don't need someone to bottle feed me. I don't need companies to do cartwheels and bend over backwards and provide every bit of load data because I have, um, I, in the beginning of my channel back in 2013, I said something, and I've never forgot it. Reloaders are, are smart. Uh, well, I'm going to change that. A real reloader is smart, okay? That's not to say if a person chooses just to run. If you want to just run Sierra Bullets and Sierra Load Data Manual, that's awesome. I, I, no judgment there. But don't come over and begin bashing companies because they're not tailoring everything to your needs because you don't want to step up and be smart and learn how to approach load data. So what do you say we talk about our bullet? Why would you want to use a 147 grain? I mean, you can go anywhere you want and find load data for 124 grain round nose. You can find that all day long. And um, so why? Well, okay, the first thing I'm just gonna say is the 147 grain round nose, even any round nose of this caliber, it's not a hunting bullet. Okay, when I think of this bullet, the 147 grain, back when I ordered it, I thought of the 158 grain round nose uh, 38 special. That's the most worthless round in the world other than it just makes good trigger time because um, it's going so slow and it's just a round nose and it just goes through. Kind of like um, if you're hunting rabbit, you know, you want to get yourself a good meal, a 158 grain round nose 38 special will simply go through a rabbit and a lot of the times that rabbit will run into the hole and you won't get your rabbit a little squirrel you can shoot a little squirrel in front of those and they'll just run right away this this run away okay um so uh, ideally if you want to get a rabbit with a handgun don't use an expanding hollow point like an xtp because there's nothing left to eat just use a semi wad cutter okay um uh, that's great. Rabbit bleeds out fast, you got a meal. But see, the problem with the uh, 147 grain round nose 
124 grain, anything round nose, this under a big bore, is when the bullet enters the flesh, as it enters, the flesh closes behind it and the animal doesn't bleed out. It just suffers. It's a terrible thing to do to an animal. I would never shoot a coyote with a the 38 Special if I had the chance, because you're going to wound them, you know. I don't, I don't like to see animals suffer. That, that's not my gig, okay. Um, a round nose bullet should only be used for self-defense if it's big bore or larger. Big bore is considered 40 caliber. Uh, Sierra Low Data Manual, if I remember right, says uh, 0.45, uh, 45 or larger. I agree with that. I wouldn't use a 40 cal round nose for self-defense, anything like that. The 45, when you get that big, it leaves such a big hole that the flesh can't close up and you have bleed out. Okay. There's some extra information for you, but we've summed it up that this bullet is not for, it's only for target shooting. Um, whatever you're going to shoot for targets. But more specifically, it's got more specific applications than that. And there's the third one you'll laugh at. First one would be a 124 grain doesn't have quite enough ump to knock your steel target over. Okay. Um, actually, there's four. The last one you'll laugh at, though. So one, a little heavier bullet to get your target to drop over. Two, um, if you're running suppressed, these are subsonic loads. Subsonic. Want to run a suppressor? Way to go. So if you master this, you're going to have fun with your suppressor, trust me. You want to run a, your rifle, you, you know, great bullet for that, right? <clears throat> The third reason that I like, I really like, is the recoil. Very minimal recoil. Rise on the front sight, man, you're coming down and bang, 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 bang. It's, it's really nice. That's, that's, that, that's a cool bullet for that. I noticed that right off the bat. And um, the recoil is so much more manageable. I like that. I really do. Then the fourth reason is the only bullet you can find. We can't get bullets. So, so here's these 147 grains that, well, guys are afraid to to load but now you're going to be able to load it right so um, these are your reasons for why you would want to load this bullet other than another reason is you just want to you want to use a little experience okay so <clears throat> um, for this uh, bullet once again this is by Summit City this is what they have to offer what's nice uh, like I said I've only shot a couple hundred rounds through this uh, of this bullet and I, I shot through multiple pistols but because it's a high-tech coating, I, you know, I never saw any leading, which I wouldn't have because I didn't have the, the high of volume. Um, but they, they cleaned up nice, but I haven't had anyone tell me that running the 147 created any kind of leading issue. So I think that's, that's going to be a plus to this bullet. Lower velocities and high-tech, and you're going to have a nice clean barrel, that's, that's for sure. Nice, nice clean bore. So I want to talk about um, <coughs> brass or brass to use you know range brass is, is great okay when you can get it it's so cheap but it kind of bites a lot of guys um, especially on a progressive machine I get a lot of guys and they get all these different funky case designs and it interrupts it interrupts the operation of the machine and it frustrates a lot of reloaders to where um, you know out of every 50 rounds they ruined four and um, their quality control is less because things didn't run as smooth as they could have which brings me to this um, you can go to Starline you can order as many as you want in bulk and they'll deliver them um, the advantage to this uh, with these dies you'll see this um, one you don't have to worry about a primer pocket. Two, you don't have to worry about that stepped case that has a thicker wall inside. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about inspecting, making sure that they don't have different design features that way. Uh, you don't have to worry about looking at the primer pocket. You don't have to worry about removing the crimp. It's just gonna work, right? The seating of your primer is gonna be so much smoother 
Um, the uniformity in seat depth is going to be correct. Um, I can't say how important that is, right? Um, <clears throat> so then because the idea is you're going to take this new brass. Let's say you order a thousand cases from Starline. I don't know how many you want to order. And you say, you know, I think I'm going to develop my load. And then I'm going to load 200 at a time. And I'm going to rotate every time I shoot those 200 up, I'm going to reload those. And I'll keep them all together in batches until I've spent their life. And they're done. And then you'll recycle them for more money. But through that, in length, they're going to be more uniform than if you had range cases of different length. So now on our dies, we have a very precise crimped die that we can literally turn by the off the micrometer and crimp. So the more uniform your lengths are, the more uh, the better your crimp's going to be, um, and the more precise your ammunition is going to be. Precision just doesn't have to do with rifles. Precision is a wide it's a wide topic here. You can put as much precision into your handgun. I told I told one viewer this, right? I I said, well. If you don't think that precision doesn't go into handguns, what if you put no precision into your handguns, what kind of ammo do you have? He said, pretty bad. I said, it would be junkyard ammo. So you do put precision. It's just not, it's a different uh, pre precision. But we've got to be precise in what we do. Um, so get you some good Starline brass, start out bulk that way, and uh, you'll, um, it's a great way to go, okay? Um, as far as powder, I'm going to use this uh, number two. This is a, a great powder. This is one of my favorite powders. It's like um, for this diameter bullet, uh, this has a low density of somewhere like 0 0.6768. That just means I don't have to worry about powder migration in the case, the powder shifting. So I'm going to get more consistency from round to round. So here I have a good quality case, I get a good quality crimp, and my powder is going to be very uniform. This powder is very good for 38 caliber um, rounds, rounds of that. It just fits the bill. Um, so I'm, the other reason I'm using this is because it's just one more notch in my stock on this round that I'm using a powder and so it just gives me a, a little more um, uh, hands-on with powders right but this is a fabulous powder but the powder that you're going to use might be dependent on what's available to you but only use the powder that's listed in that Lee manual that's all you're going to use if, if you don't have it then you can't load it till you find it or unless you find another published data source with um, uh, another powder for the bullet weight you're using, okay? And then the primers, it's kind of funny. Um, I had uh, some CCI primers, I think, and some Winchesters, and I wanted to just use them up so I combined them. So I, I'm using like a buffet of small pistol primers, and I would say use small pistol primers. Can you use large? Well, I'm not gonna say you can unless you're gonna be chronographing and all that because we are walking in a little bit of a low development here. I would say, you know, can you use large primers? I would say you can, but before I would do that, I would develop this load off of the small primers. And then from there, with your experience, you'll know, you know, if you want to use a large or small pistol magnum. Um, but you would be chronographing it the whole way. And remember when you uh, change, if you change something on a load, change one component at a time, right? You're not going to change powder and primer size, right? So just keep that in mind. So those are the components that I'm using, okay? That is how I came up with my start men's uh, charge of uh, 3.3 grains. And so now we're going to take a look at the dies. There we go. Our Lyman stainless steel uh, pro die set. 
uh, for a set of dies these are the nicest I have I've ever worked with uh, stainless steel dies I'll show you the features to each die as we progress through them they're easy setup they're very precise and they're like silk so let's get started we'll need the resize and decap die first the first die in our Lyman Pro die set is the resize and decap die. To disassemble so you can clean it, just unthread and remove the top cap like that. Then you just gently push up on this entire assembly. It will pull out like that. One uh, feature I, I really favor on this die is it's spring-loaded. Uh, it's a very nice spring too. It's a heavy-duty little spring if you get to looking at it. A nice thick heavy decap assembly. This spring helps to force the primer out of the primer pocket. So you don't have to worry about uh, crimped primer getting halfway decapped. It's going to pop it all the way out. Okay. Very nice, I like that. Kind of shoots it out like a shotgun. Um, I, I love the lock rings right there. Uh, that's, that's, that's my favorite lock ring. I love how they've done that. And uh, it's, it's a one inch open end wrench. Uh, takes very little effort to tighten it. Now, um, for me, this is the um, best part about this die. For my semi-auto pistols, I don't care for a typical carbide ring. I would rather have a, a steel die, um, a full length. So I resize the full length of the case. Well, if you look in this die, it's a full length insert. Instead of a carbide ring, it's a full length insert and it's uh, tapered. So, you know, we have 11 thousandths difference between the base and the mouth of the cartridge case for the 9 millimeter. Well, this is going to uh, fit that. It's tapered so that we can resize our 9mm back to a uh, full SAMI min. So, um, they've done a really nice job on this. And uh, carbide's not cheap. But uh, the idea behind this is uh, being the stainless steel dies, the, the massive carbide ring, you're going to get a ton of reloads out of this so, so it's a very, very nice setup so to reassemble it simply put our insert back in there like that and we're ready to install it into our press begin by running your lock ring all the way up the uppermost portions of the threads. Take your shell holder, run it all the way to top dead center, and now I'm going to show you how Lyman uh, instructs to set this die up, then I'll show you how I do it. Lyman's instructions are Thread the die down until you make contact with the top of the shell holder. From there you're going to back it off just enough that you could put a matchbook, the thickness of a matchbook in between that uh, shell holder and the mouth of the die. And then you just kind of snug it against that matchbook. How I do it, when I come down and I just make contact with that uh, shell holder. I just just back it off about a horse's hair and call it good. Now, hold the die in position. Run your lock ring down like such. Take a one-inch open-end wrench. It's not going to take much. Torque it down like that. Now, what we're going to do? We're going to take the two spent cartridge cases 
that need to be resized and decapped. Place them into the shell holder. Now if you'll listen, you'll hear the decap force the primer out of the case. That's going to ensure that like on a case where it's a crimped primer pocket, it's not going to halfway decap the primer. It's going to shoot it all the way out. Very nice. Nicely done. So there's our first one. There's our second one. Now what we want to do is just make sure there we go. You want to make sure that you're going to have cage cage fit. Okay. So there we go. The next die will be the Lyman case flare die. You'll see it, they've got it marked on the top, it says case flare. So, run the lock ring up like that. We'll index our turret head over one position. And now, just get your die started. The next thing we need to do before we can set this die up, we have to have a beginning measurement and an ending measurement from the top of the mouth of that case. So, with taking your dial calipers, I'm looking at about 72. Okay? Now, I know just from doing this enough that when I get to about, say, 82 to 83 for my cast bullet that's going to be sufficient enough flare so we have to we're going to put that case into the shell holder and we are going to adjust this down until we're about 82 83 thousandths right in there um, okay so we're going to run our case up like that we'll take this die and we're going to start threading it down Okay, once you're touching, lower the ram so the case is no longer up into the die. Pick a spot on the top of your die so you can judge how far you're threading it. And I'm going to thread it in not quite two turns. Now we're going to run the cartridge case back up into the die take my calipers 80 I need uh, say two to three more thousands the idea behind the case flare is to flare the mouth of the case enough that we can slip the bullet in without shaving it the nice thing about this uh, bullet is is it's beveled so we don't have to have as much flare on the case the less flare we have the more life you're going to get out of the the case now if you don't have enough flare you you there's a chance you'll seat the bullet without shaving it but you you could bulge your case so you need to get your flare just right There's about 81. There's, I'm at 82. If I really turn that case and look at it, I'm at 82. So now what we're going to do, when we get to about 82, now we're checking to see how nice our bullet fits. And that's pretty good. I think I'm going to just stop it right there. Okay. So now that We've got the case flare where we want. We'll run our cartridge case back up. And we're going to run our lock ring down like that. Just slightly snug the lock ring. This is our bullet seat die. So begin by setting the micrometer to the 
top position. The top position will be five. Now, this is your thimble scale. This is the sleeve scale. There's our index mark. Each one of these index marks on the thimble scale is going to represent one thousandths on the overall length of your cartridge okay so one complete revolution on that thimble scale will represent fifty thousandths so let's start out with taking the lock ring and run it all the way up just like that incidentally I have the bullet seating insert for the round nose bullet let's just get it started into place while we're at it let's index over now what we're going to need the case that we just flared Let's set it aside. In that other case that we decapped and resized, let's put it into the shell holder like that. Now we're going to run that shell holder all the way up. You should feel nothing. Now we're going to run this die down just until we touch that case once we touch that case now we are setting it up so we can taper crimp and we don't want to crimp with this die so I'm touching I don't want that so I'm going to back it off now for the viewers, you need to be able to see this scale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back it off one extra revolution so you can see that scale. But when you're setting it up, you're going to come down to where you touch the mouth of that case and then basically turn it to where you can see the scale just back it off to where it's comfortable for you whether it's to here or to here or wherever you want it so for the video here we go I'm gonna come down gonna make contact we don't want that we don't want to crimp we're only seating so I'm gonna back it out normally I would be right about here but for you I'm gonna go the extra mile now once you have that micrometer set where you want you're going to tighten the lock ring now we can remove this case and we're going to take the case that we flared and put it back into our shell holder. Now what we're going to do, now we're going to run this down somewhere around 3. And if you want, you can actually make a recording of this. This is where, once you learn to get this set up, if you're using all Starline brass, you know you've adjusted this to the same length of brass the same every time so now you can begin recording 
where you're initially sitting this micrometer. I, I don't. I, I don't. Just because I know whereabouts I'm adjusting it to. So I'm going to go a little above half, and now I'm going to put my bullet. Now, don't take your bullet and do this. Don't do that. That's going to cost you a lot of problems with, uh, it's going to cost uh, feeding issues for you, okay? So now I'm going to come in. So now we've got a pretty generous seat on the bullet. It's definitely more than soft seated into position. I'm going to take a measurement and I am measuring 1.165. I want per Lee's uh, measurement of their cartridge overall length to be 1.145. So I have to seat down 20 thousandths more. So, what I'll do, come here like this, 5, 10, 15, 20, look at that. 1.145 exactly okay but now I'm gonna throw a little curve ball into this mix this is the length that our books calling for but earlier I told you for m my pistols I have uh, multiple nine millimeter pistols I know that on some of them this won't work. If this will work in one of your nine millimeters or all of your nine millimeters, then you're perfect right here. But I know that won't work. So I'm going to take this other case that we uh, decapped and resized, and I'm going to go ahead and expand it. Now I'm going to take another bullet. I'm going to seat it and let's double check see our length 1.145 or thereabouts or about you know a thousand soft but we're right there what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust this one two three about four and a half thousand it's not quite five thousands I want to sneak up on that one point one four zero okay so I'm right there so this is the length that I want to end up with so what we have is we have right now two dummy cartridges. One is uh, seated to... We have two dummy cartridges. One is seated to the 1.145 and the other one is seated to the 1.140. Now remember, we're working with uh, the load data for a 147 grain lead bullet. We're starting um, just a tenth of a grain above a min so that uh, five thousandths less case capacity isn't enough to give us a severe overpressure situation. Okay, so now what we got to do is get our crimp die set up, and this also has a micrometer. Get the micrometer sets. It goes to all the way to two. Get it. I get it set just above one, right about halfway up that that uh, sleeve scale. And now let's go ahead and start threading this in. And now what we're going to do? We're going to take one of these cartridge cases. 
and we're going to run it up and we're going to take this die and we're just going to run it down until you feel it just touch that case. Once you feel it, you're going to want to stop. Don't keep going because it's going to start closing the mouth of that case. Now, I'm just starting to touch it. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go a little further so you can see the scale. Once you're where you can see the scale, go ahead and tighten your lock ring. And now what we're going to do, we're going to take a measurement. Once again, this is where when you're working with all new Starline brass, you can custom tailor it. I'm sitting at 77 thousandths. And your, yours is going to vary because different cases have different thicknesses, right? So I'm right around 77. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to increase this by about 15 thousandths because I've done it enough I know that I can at least go that far. Okay, I need to go a little further. I'm going to go until I get a thousandths to two thousandths smaller diameter. The thousands, thousands and a half, right in there. That's all I need. Okay. So now, because your uh, crimp die has nothing to do with length, we go ahead and bring this other one and crimp it. All right. So. For this part of the video, take what you want and leave what you don't. Earlier in the video when we started out, I was talking about how the length that Lee is using for their cartridge of 1.145, it's a great length if it will function properly in your pistol. But what I found is because we have a bit more bulk closer to the nose what I found is this length cartridge it will chamber in some of my pistols but others I see a little bit of rifling marks going on so what we want to do we want to take this and we want to actually chamber it in our pistols to make sure we're going to have fit okay now First off, make sure all of your pistols or your pistol is unloaded, okay? I have my slides open, magazines out, so I'm good to go. Now, what I'm about to do with this is going to help me do a few things. One, because I'm going to be repeatedly chambering it, it's going to give me a chance to see how well my crimp is holding. Now, if you don't have, you know, if you only have one pistol, then you can simply chamber it multiple times in that one pistol to see how your crimp is holding. And what you'll do is each time you chamber it and then eject it, you're going to take a, a measurement and just see uh, if the bullet has any setback. Because what happens when we chamber this into the pistol, 
that bullet's going to slam into that feed ramp and it's going to tend to want to set back into the case. So this is a great exercise to let you know just how good you're doing uh, with neck tension and your crimping. Now, it's also going to help us to verify that we have a proper cartridge to magazine fit. If it doesn't fit, it's not going to function, right? So, once again, uh, making sure your pistol is not loaded, we'll start out with this, this first pistol, my uh, SIG uh, P365. It's an excellent pistol. Uh, I love it. So, here we go. Here's the first one. Um, so, upon ejecting, you're going to see, you know, okay, we got a little scratch there. That's from coming up out of the magazine into the feed ramp. That's going to be normal wear and tear, but, okay, we're holding good, okay? And we don't see any, any rifling going on. So we're just going to, um, you know, go down the line here and uh, okay that's typical that's that's just fine that's just got a lot going on there okay my length is right where it was Now. All right, that was a little rough, and I I suspected that my my spring fields. Uh, okay, here we go. This is what I'm talking about. That it's running it into the lands. You don't want that. My spring fields, they're just tighter. They they just are. Okay. And I'm holding, doing a good job. Okay, see it's, there we go. Now, in all fairness, I've shot these spring fills very little. They've got very little uh, round count through them. We're holding really good, but now we see two rifling grooves, all right? This pistol, the sweetheart, I think it'll just that Ruger SR1911, that's the 9mm Commander, it'll feed all day. All day. Won't let you down. This uh, Ruger Security 9, <laughs> I don't I don't shoot it with... Actually, I have shot it with a rubber band on, just messing around, but I just leave the rubber band on there because it looks cool. But I don't shoot it with that on. When I bought this, the price was right. I, I, I couldn't pass it up, you know. And after I bought it, I was like, you know, why did I buy this thing? Then I shot it, and I was like, you know what? It's a good, just a good service pistol altogether. You know, can't can't, can't beat it. You know. So uh, there we go. Uh, so the two pistols that I have issues with would be the the spring fills. Now, this this will function through, uh, you know, both uh, these two Rugers, this Ruger EC9 and my Sig P365 a little hiccup with the, the spring fills, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> now, let's just take this one. There we go. None. Perfect. That 5,000 shorter Beautiful. That five 
thousands shorter enables me to successfully chamber that and I look like I've fallen back about a thousand that that's okay I can I can increase my crimp by another thousandth no problem and that's the time to find out if you're gonna have an issue and I'll tell you this um, that two thousand setback uh, this was already a thousand short, half a thousand short. Uh, this would feed just fine if you had a, if you had a whole magazine full crimped to this and a whole bucket of ammo. It's going to feed. That's not a bad crimp. A little more, and we've really got it. Okay. So um, now, uh, because originally when I was talking, we have our uh, modern reloading by. Uh, Richard Lee, we have a 147 grain lead bullet. We're going to match it to uh, just slightly above our min charge. With this being 5,000 shorter, we're not really going to see uh, this huge internal pressure spike. And actually, what might happen is because the pressure is going to go up a slight little bit in there, it might be a pretty nice round. It just might be, right? So so that's how I do it. I, I, I make sure, first of all, physically it's going to fit. But then I match this lead bullet to the same weight lead bullet in the Lee uh, reloading data manual. And then I start about, oh, just a, a tenth above min. So what do you say we go load some up? Let's go. All right, we're going to warm our Lyman Gen 6 powder measure up. Uh, it takes three minutes to warm it up, but it's, it's ready to go because I was messing with it earlier. So it, it's ready to rock and roll. Now, what I do, I'm just going to show you this. If I wanted, I could uh, go ahead and, you know, resize, flare, prime, charge, seat and crimp all at once. You, you can do that. But I prefer to um, resize, flare, and prime, get all that done, and then I will charge, seat, and crimp in a separate step. Okay? So I, I really like this powder measure. I'm going to show you why. So I'm going to start off here. <laughs> now, these are new cases. You want to resize new cases. Okay, resize all cases that are new, right? So there's my, my resize, there's my flare. Okay. You want to make sure on your primer, your past flush, uh, with this new Starline brass, I don't have to worry about uh, any uh, military, uh, you know, nothing there to block it, that military cramp from impeding that primer. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to place them in the load block primer up. So there we go.
<laughs> Get in there. There we go. Nice and smooth. If you feel it wanting to force, I'm going to back off and reline it. Line it all up and then go back at it. But don't force it. So I have uh, primed all these and like I said, um, I combined uh, two partial small primer packages, so intermixed colors, that's okay. So they look pretty good, nice pass flush, um, they look good. So now what I'm going to do um, on my scale here, you have to bear with me, I'm going to set this for 3.3. .3 start now what I do I have two digital scales of course I got my beam type scales while that's doing what it's doing I'm going to come over to this digital scale and I'm going to hit it to zero it's all calibrated what I'm going to do okay this one is at 3 3 I'm going to come over here and I'm going to weigh the charge perfect Three, three. Okay. So I know my my scale is on. So here we go. Now this is pretty cool. Because I got that on auto. It's going to take right off. Now each time I do this, just verify that. We got my charge. Pay attention to what you're doing. This uh, pan that Lyman has, it's like no other pan. It it pours so easily into this uh, thinner diameter case. Really nice. So it's almost like that scale paces me. It just paces me. It has full audio beep so I know when, when it's done and uh, my low density the low density on these cases man is just super nice fill out on the charge. You know, I'll tell you what I really appreciate about this setup is in our world today, components, they are tough to find. Uh, I'll give you that. But the nice thing about it is this setup right here, yeah, I might not be putting out, uh, you know, 500 rounds an hour, but I'm having a good time. And everything is very precise and um, it's just a nice time so I gotta say uh, honestly this is as good as it gets and um, it's just a nice time to be had it's pretty nice to come out here in the evening let my Gen 6 warm up and then just sit here and plug away, plug away. It's like, you know, turn the radio on and uh, turn the radio on, K 
kick back. One thing about these dies, being that uh, that heavy duty carbide die, you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, you're not going to damage that die if you got a dirty case. You know, I recommend you still get your case cleaned up, but that die is bulletproof. It's it's gonna it's gonna last a long time. That's the whole idea behind that die. It's a it's a commercial grade die. <laughs> I'm not gonna wear it out. If you can wear that resized die out, whatever you do, don't send it in to have it replaced. Frame it as a trophy because that means you did a lot. You did a whole lot. So there, there's there's 10 rounds. And if I can do 10 rounds, I can do 100. And if I can do 100, I can do 500. So there we go. Now the last thing I'm going to do, come over here and I'm going to verify that... Uh, my tr my charge weight is still where it should be. Oh, hang on, hang on, gotta reset my scale here. Come on, wake up. Now, out of all fairness, it says three two. That's fluctuating. Okay, there. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. So there we go. You want to check your charge at the beginning. You want to ch check it periodically, and uh, uh, the best way to go. So there we go. So turn this bad boy off here. All right. So there you go. I hope that this video helps you to be able to put together that load data based off of your bullet weight and bullet type in way of bullet construction. In other words, you know, you have a 147 grain lead bullet and you've got data for a 170 grain lead bullet. You can bring those together. You keep the jacketed bullet with the jacketed data. You keep the copper plated bullet with the copper plated data. You keep the lead bullet with the lead data. And what do you do? You start pretty doggone close to men, and then you begin working up a tenth at a time, and you chronograph your work, and you study what you're doing, and you uh, start getting that experience, and that will give you confidence, but don't let your confidence uh, get too far out, because when you don't, uh, when you get too confident, that's when we start making mistakes, right? So there we go, guys and gals. That's the end of this video. God bless. We'll see you on the next.